My name is Misha Mansour, and I play guitar in Periphery. You haven't been in Europe for a while now. How is it to be back? How do you feel? Well, yeah, it's been a little while. I want to say it's been four years, maybe longer. Um, it's been great because there's been an entire pandemic. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we always wonder with these things how people will react, how fans will react. Um, and I wouldn't take any of this stuff for granted. We play a very weird style of music. We do have loyal fans, but who knows, you know, if if all our fans had disappeared or stopped caring, I wouldn't have blamed them. So it's a very pleasant surprise to see that it's still going strong and people seem to be excited to see us. Um, you know, we're early on in the tour still. This is, what, the fourth, fourth show today? Yeah, it's the fourth show today, but... So far, these are all the best we have done in these respective markets, so can't really ask for more, can we? Yeah, I mean, it's been, I think, 2019, time before the pandemic. Well, for me, it's the first show of Periphery, and I'm very excited. Well, I hope you enjoy the show tonight, then. You mentioned that some people may not be familiar with your music because you play a very more complex, more weird genre, if I can call it. And wait, how would you describe uh, your music to someone that, for example, is the first time hearing your music now? I mean, I would generally say it's sort of progressive metal, if uh, if that's the kind of thing they would understand. If if you know people aren't as familiar with metal, <laughs> I would just say we play rock music or heavy music. But uh, generally speaking, that's our approach. And I always thought progressive metal sort of gave you the the most options when it came to writing and recording it seems like there isn't anything you can't do if you're doing progressive music and it's pretty aggressive as well and i think if you come to a live show you'll see that it's got the energy of a metal show so progressive metal seems to be the best way to, to describe it yeah i mean it also has layers upon layers upon layers so I want to talk a little bit about your new album. It's very unique and it's very layered and a complex uh, record. So I want to talk a little bit about the themes and concepts about uh, in this record, particularly. How do you find those themes and concepts and how they influence your music, especially in this album? I think when it comes to themes from a lyrical standpoint, that's really more of a, Sp a Spencer question. I don't really deal with lyrics and I don't as much as we're all involved with all aspects and we may be involved with let's say tweaking lyrics the concepts and all that come from Spencer um, as far as like the musical motifs and abstract concepts from just a purely musical standpoint I'd say it's a very intuitive thing it's not something that we put much active thought into and probably the most active thought we put into it is before we start we we'll usually have some sort of conversation as a band as to what we want the album to sound like and what we think it should be. And I think pretty much every time, including this time, the album ends up sounding completely different anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, these things sort of just take on a life of their own and we figure out what it sounds like as we work on it. And we do what, what I like to call just sort of following the thread. So you're just sort of seeing where the song wants to go and where it takes you and you're sort of discovering it as you go. So I think there's a much more loose approach there as opposed to, let's say, a strict concept that we feel we need to adhere to. So basically like a video game, you just navigate and discover stuff. It's like an, it's like an open world video game, yeah. It's you like make a... your own adventure out of it. I want to talk a little bit also about the tracks, some tracks in particular from this album. And uh, I noticed the length of those are a little bit longer compared to all the other records you had before. And you also have, of course, very long and intricate pieces like Jacqueline Gross. And uh, I want to, can we discuss a little bit the creative process behind those longer pieces? Like, how do you structure those songs? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, it's when we're, when we're putting these things together, we're not really paying attention to the length. Mm. And then once we've got like kind of an arrangement that we've settled on or that we feel is generally there, 
that's the point where we'll be like, how long is this song? Oh, wow, it's this length or whatever. Sometimes in the case of, I don't even remember with, with Dracul Gras if it was like the kind of thing where where we noticed it was getting long or at the end we're like, wow, okay, all right, we're hitting 10 minutes for this one. But uh, it, it's it's not really an important thing. Maybe it's something that should be more important because maybe I, I wish we had put a, a shorter song on the album. <laughs> Certainly from a music video standpoint, it would have been a little bit cheaper. They do have short songs. Everything is fine is pretty short. If, if we four or five minutes, everything is fine. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I guess, relatively speaking, that's a shorter song. And even that, yeah, mm-hmm. I think, is in the five minute uh, area. But again, we're not really thinking about song length. We're just... Or when we're writing, we're thinking about it from, is the idea complete? Is the mm-hmm. sentence complete or the thought complete? And there are certain songs that it doesn't take very much to get to that point. And then there's other songs where it just feels like it has more to say. Or to use your Elden Ring example, that there's more to explore. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you have Reptile. Uh, that song is about 16, 17 minutes. Yeah, around that. Well, it didn't beat Jeff Fierce's record. They had like 20 minutes songs. Someone's always <laughs> going to have a longer song. <laughs> but that song, it, you know, it's another example of... That's the first thing that we wrote for Periphery 4. I think we were just very excited to write. And we were messing with a tuning that we'd never played with before. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of the perfect storm to just get a whole bunch of ideas out. And we wrote that song fairly quickly. I mean, it was written pretty much entirely as it is from an instrumental standpoint over the course of three subsequent days. So it happened very fast. And it's just because we were just bursting with ideas. And then we realized, oh, wow, we've got to tell the rest of the guys that we wrote this long song. And I really hope that they don't veto it or hate it or whatever. And and this is this is generally how it goes for songs. Is just we're writing and we're not really paying attention to really anything other than how does this feel? Do we feel good about this? Okay, cool. Do we not feel good about this? Can this be fixed? Or maybe we can't fix it. Maybe let's put this one off to the side for later. Maybe we can tackle it at a later date. It's it's a very intuitive process. What's your favorite song in the album? It's hard to uh, it's hard to pick. My personal favorite is "Everything Is Fine." That's a good that's a good one. It's that's very, a fun one. It's very raw and emotional. I don't know. It hits you like straight in your face somehow. That was the that was the goal with that one, and I think if if there's a reason I like that song, it's because sometimes. It's hard to get the idea of the song to actually... It's hard to make the song actually have the effect that you want it to have, right? Mm -hmm. So you have an idea for a song that's very aggressive. And you have an idea for a song that should sound raw and emotional. But sometimes it just doesn't get sold that way. Sometimes there's something, you know, there's just so many variables when you're recording something. and, And everyone's getting all their input and everything's being put together. And sometimes something gets lost. Mm. Um, and and a lot of times there's this raw characteristic or this emotional characteristic that maybe can get like polished out or over polished, like over refined. And I was really happy that that song came out sort of the way that, that for me personally I wanted, I intended mm. for it, which was very raw. Like it's a very raw kind of unrefined song in just the right way. I, I'm glad that we pulled that one off. Are going to play it live? Uh, I would love to. What? Play Everything Is Fine Live. We haven't rehearsed it. As a we haven't rehearsed yeah. it, but eventually I would like to play it. Yeah. I think that would be fun. It, it would be fun for everyone except for, <laughs> for Matt. Oh, no. <laughs> he had, he'd, have his, uh, he'd have his work cut out for him. It, it's by far the hardest song for him. Is there any particular instrument or... I don't know, piece of equipment, well, besides the obvious, the guitar that you used in this album and it was crucial? 
I mean, <laughs> you know, the computer. <laughs> And, and I, I'm not saying that to be facetious. Uh, it's such a powerful tool for composition, you know, between being able to recreate a virtual orchestra on it and have it sound realistic, um, you know, software synthesizers, being able to basically pull any sound that you want at any time. Um, <clears throat> in a way, it almost turns you more into like a curator of ideas rather than a guitarist or a traditional producer. Uh, and when you have a machine that can make infinite sounds, you know, it's sort of like narrowing it down to, uh, to, to what you want. But that's a, that's, you know, it's such a crucial part of how we work. And maybe at this point, something that we take very for granted, but we are, I think of this era, you know, of, of the, the musicians and producers who work in a room with our computers, you know, all of us, pretty much, you know, Spencer, Spencer's a, a, a force of nature with a computer in a room as well. And like, it, we're, we're probably one of the, the first bands from that era to like, switch over from like, let's say, bands in a room, who would jam, which is something we don't really do, you know, you don't jam, we just, and it's not because we don't want to. I'd love to. I think we'd do it well, but we all live far apart. It's hard to get together. And when we get together, it's usually to get work done, which means rehearsing for tour. There's usually a very specific goal, and that goal isn't, hey, let's jam and see what happens. Um, I think I'd like to fix that in the future. But for now, yeah, the computer is sort of how we get our work done. Um, so that's probably the the unsung hero, as uh, as boring as it may sound. Absolutely, it's not boring. I mean, we live in a digital world. Everybody uses computer for different reasons. And I've seen the documentary. Like you have a lot of gear in your house. Yeah. Is this where you record actual the albums in your place? I mean, yeah, we. Um... The only thing that's not recorded in someone's house is the the drums. Where you know Matt will fly out to various studios. In this case, we went to Real World, or we, him and Nolly, went to Real World, which is an incredible studio, and and captured uh, probably my favorite sounding drums of any project that I've been involved with. So you know that's where it's worth the expense and the time. Mm -hmm. And when you have someone as talented as Nolly at the helm, and you have a drummer as amazing as Matt. You can capture something very magical, you know. Um, short of that, I probably would have just programmed it, and that's what I've done on <laughs> my my solo project and side projects. But um, yeah, it's you know uh, Spencer works out. At, I guess now now you have your studio, but P five you tracked in your yeah, in, in your the, room, in yeah, the spare room, yeah, in the spare room in in, in the house you used to live in. And I, cool. I did the guitars, and we we kind of wrote everything in in my room at, at my spot in Los Angeles. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's all kind of done in bedrooms, <laughs> and uh, yeah, the it, it's it's just it's just sort of what works for us. It's our it's our comfort zone at this point. But I do have all this gear, you know, that I get to plug into this computer. So. <laughs> And, and and I think we all uh, we all appreciate. It. I know Spencer and I appreciate our gear. We have a quite a collection of things that we find nice. very inspiring. You know. You mentioned Nolly, and uh, I wanted to ask what's his role in the creation of this album. Is he, was he producing? Was he helping, advising, or doing something more? Um, he he's not really producing in the traditional sense. We're sort of self-producing. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll handle the uh, sort of instrumental side of things, and we're all kind of producers. But I'll sort of head up that side. Uh, Spencer's heading up the vocal side of things, and you know when we're working on instrumental stuff, we'll be doing it more so in my spot. Mm -hmm. When we're working on vocals, we're doing more so at Spencer's spot. Um, you know, what, the drums are programmed, and everyone has input on on everything, and then when Matt has to fly to the UK to do drums. That's where we're sort of trusting Nolly 
and he understands our sound. Being an ex-band member, being a business partner, being one of our best friends, he genuinely understands. So there's there's a lot of trust being put in him to do, and there's a lot of decisions and and minutia and and work that he's putting in that has to come down to trust. I can't micromanage. No one can micromanage. So you know they go out to the studio and we get the tracks back and I'm like, wow, this is great. And then obviously we trust him with mixing, but he also really sort of needs and values our input. So we had a lot of, a lot of back and forth on the mix to get it to where I think certain members are, are pickier than others. So I know that, that Spencer and I are probably the pickiest when it comes to the mix. So we probably had the most feedback but um, it's always great to have another set of ears on it. Uh, and I'm not a big fan of mixing. Nolly's so good at it. So mm -hmm. I think we ended up with a mix I was extremely happy with. And um, it took a few rounds of back and forth. But again, he understands what it is that we're looking for. So it makes the whole process a lot simpler. That's amazing when you have such a person that actually you're in the same uh, level of kind of energy and vibes and yeah creative we're, thinking we're very lucky oh and I, and I completely forgot i mean i i i write the bass parts and for this album i i was just programming them with midi but we just have nolly learn it and play it which which he does which is great that's a gift right there you know because no one's gonna okay. it's again he understands this the tone we're going for and him and i have a very close understanding of what i want out of the interplay of guitars and bass, and he, he just to know the songs really well through the drum recording process too. Yeah, yeah. At the same time, so 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 he can approach it. He's like almost a band member, even though he's technically not a band member anymore. But he's a band member in every way that really matters mm -hmm. during the recording of an album and with the responsibility of the roles that he's taking on. So he records these incredible bass parts and it and it makes our album sound so much better uh, and that's you know this setup is how i would love for it to continue moving forward basically i mean that sounds really incredible and plus a little bit more jamming a little, uh, yeah, a a little, little bit. That, that that that's very true like if there was any tweak it would be a little more jamming but but the setup for actually going to record it i'm very yeah. happy i have some questions for spencer as well because you're the vocalist, and of course I wanted to ask a little bit more about the lyrics and um, how do you approach them, right? Your band has a wide range of moods and atmospheres, and how do you adapt your vocal delivery in conveying those moods? Um, everything I do is really, really based on kind of what I'm feeling at the time that I'm writing the song. Um, and I never go into anything thinking like, you know, I'm going to write about this, or this is the kind of emotion I'm going to portray. Everything's very stream of consciousness. I'll, I'll sit down and just play off of what I'm feeling in the moment. I wanted to ask actually, what are your inspiration from the non-metal scene as a vocalist? Oh man, there's, I don't even know where to start. There's, there's a lot there. Um, yeah, I, I listen to anything from ranging from like Image and Heap and, um, you know, Faith No More to like, even like some like old punk rock stuff, like, mm. you know, like uh, hardcore punk, like AFI, um, yeah, the, the, the older yeah, the older yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. I stopped listening to them after they went a little, a little more mainstream. Can you share maybe some insights into your uh, lyrical interpretation? For maybe you have like a favorite song also from the record, or a very, I don't know, memorable <laughs> song or special song. I think my, I don't, I can't speak for everyone else, but I think my favorite song in the record is "Draw Cool Grass," and funnily, it's like those are the least serious lyrics on the record. I heard that. Yeah, it's a very very playful song. You know, it's a kind of a story we all came up with together, and uh, Matt even helped write some of the lyrics on that song. We had a we had a good time with that one. Yeah. And um, I don't know. You know, thinking about it now, that might be for a reason. I I think I was going through a very dark period when we were you know writing this record, writing and recording it, and that was kind of like the comedic relief for me. So like I have a lot of good memories attached to you know creating that song. I was looking for deeper, you know, meanings. <laughs> when I was reading the lyrics, I was like, "Is this like for, for real? 
like, no, there should be something more to it. But I guess not. I guess oh, it's yeah, a fun very, song. very surface level song. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's a very silly song with a very yeah. silly story. Um, it's, a, it's a good story. It's a great it's story, a though. Story. But we were really laughing. Happy. We were laughing about it the whole time. Yeah. I, we never really. Because normally, if we're doing doing a concept one, we'd leave it to him. And the concept's kind of serious, but this is like a concept song where we all kind of agreed on the concept beforehand. And it's, it's funny too, because like the the demo title of the song was "Fat Dracula," yeah, and we were all thinking, you know, for for a while we were like, "What are we going to write the song about?" You know, I was trying to think, "What are we going to create the story about?" And I was like, "What if we just write it about literally a fat Dracula?" Yeah, <laughs> it sort of just <laughs> took life from there. So yeah. I want yeah. to turn it into a movie. Yeah. Exactly. That would be amazing. That would be so much fun. Not like a 12-15 minute movie or like the Def Punk version of when they did it in 99, like the whole yeah, uh, yeah. Intergalactic yeah. of 555. Yeah, it's too bad like, making long form videos. <laughs> so much yeah, so, someone wants to throw us a budget, we're, uh, we're there. Yeah. I think the Swedish band Avatar, they have a whole one hour metal movie. Just they base it on their album and they made a movie out of their album basically. So expensive. That's yeah. all I can yeah. when I hear stuff like that I'm just like, God, it must movies. be nice having that kind of money. <laughs> yeah. Or friends. I don't know. Do you have some you know, funny or memorable uh, memories about touring in general? This tour just started and I'm so jet lagged I barely remember anything. Yeah, um, I've, been, I've been sleeping until five PM every day. Oh. So. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> Jet lag is not funny, but okay. No, jet yeah. lag sucks. Uh, it's just such a short tour. I'm, it's, it takes <coughs> so long for me to, to adjust to the schedule over here. Um, so I was like, ah, I might just stay on my old, you know, the time back home for this for the rest oh. of this tour. Um, There's just been a lot of laughs in yeah, general. Yeah, it's a pretty lighthearted tour. Yeah. Everybody gets along really well, which is nice. So it's kind of like a vacation. In that way, like we get to spend, like we don't get to see each other very often in person. Doing a tour like this, we get to spend a lot of time together in a short period of time, and we're experiencing all the stuff together. So it's like new cities, new restaurants, new fans, shows. Like you know, we have new crew members that we've never worked before. So like getting to know them and having new people, you know, that are constantly enriching the experience is just a lot of fun. So. I don't know if there's any one story because there's just so much happening in it in any single day, but it's been a very positive experience so far, I think. And like everybody's just having fun and laughing a lot, which is good. So, so I think I have like my last questions and the most important one. What is gent? Oh boy. <laughs> just uh, snuck that one in at the end there, huh? Um, so, I mean... It's uh, most importantly not a genre. Now, um, it's, uh, you know, if you're asking very seriously, it's the onomatopoeia of a guitar palm that was popularized by the band Meshuga. Yeah, by Frederick Thornton. By Frederick Thornton, no. Yeah, like I think those guys, I when I posted on the Meshuga forum, they would throw that word around. People on the forum would throw that word around, and it was very clear. Um, you know, for for non guitarists, it's a it's a technique that makes it sound more metallic, let's say, and it's a it's a sound I like. So when I would put my demos up, where I would be striking power chords in a similar way, I'd say new genty idea or something funny, and it was a big inside joke on the forum. I think this sort of took a life, took on a life of its own, where people thought that I was describing the genre of music I was playing, and then it. I quickly discovered it's very hard to argue with people online. So once they decided that it was a genre, it became a genre. We don't actually care, and we 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 don't take our album titles very seriously, or even song titles seriously, because I think we know what parts of the band and the music are sacred, and we take those parts very, very, very seriously. And everything else is basically a joke. So to me, song titles are really largely irrelevant and same thing with album titles they don't matter so you might as well have some fun and just being able to see periphery five gent is not a genre genre gent that's enough right there that's the chuckle i need to get me through the day so that's a good enough reason to call it that i think some people have have, have looked again for deeper meaning and 
they're not really going to find any. But if they do, uh, more power to you. I mean, it's clearly became a meme at this point. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. It's it, it got a lot of attention which with with our fan base, and that's that's good. That only helps us out. But it was just it was just funny. That's that's the main reason why we called the album that. And I still don't know what gent is to answer your question. Uh, <laughs> I have a theory. Me and my friend think that gent actually is Swedish for chug. Well, yeah. I mean, technically, that's probably technically. that's that's probably the best. It's a Swedish chug. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you say chug in Sweden, they say gent. Yeah. So there we go. And and chug is is like an onomatopoeia of the palm mute as well. So yeah, that's probably the most accurate answer. Thank you very much for the interview. And if you have any shout outs, maybe to the fans or friends or whatever. Oh, well, we want to we wanna shout out to all the fans who've come out. We've been seeing a lot of great support again from, from everyone in Europe. I hope that continues. Want to shout out to uh, our opening band, Crooked Royals, who are on our record label, Three Dot Recordings. Very talented band and uh, very nice guys. Flew all the way from New Zealand to be here. It's, it's quite a trip. Yeah. And they're working very hard, as I understand. Yeah. They are taking trains and <laughs> non-existent trains in Germany because this is a problem. <laughs> but Especially now. Like, right now. You're but, very lucky. They're on a strike. But uh, but they are yeah they're 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 hustling to be out here, and it's uh, it's cool to see them get such a warm reception from the fans. But uh, yeah no I mean that's that, that's about it. We just want to thank everybody for coming out.